my tail was completely blown up into the air and I was hanging, flying into the air. I was completely shocked to see that. There is that glacier now. That is, that is, for very blue eyes has completely turned into the black eyes. But I can assure you one thing, mountains are changing and they are changing very fast. And something we are not doing right. very important to understand that globally climate is changing and climate is changing essentially because of they are adding a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But the impact of climate change or rise in temperature is not before proud to global. Uh, uh, so if a global climate change is approximately 1.5 degrees Celsius as of now, in Himalaya it means that 2 degrees rise in temperature. And that is essentially because of the altitude number. That means, that means Himalaya is warming at much more higher rate than global mean. Himalayan regions are rising much higher rate hmm. than global mean. And as a response to that, glaciers have started to melt. The so one more thing has happened into the mountain that the amount of precipitation has remained concentrated, uh, remains the same, but the snowfall has reduced and rainfall has increased. Okay. That is uh, due to rising temperature hmm. and it has accelerated the melt quite significantly. So what is really going to happen into the mountains is now snow is going to melt much earlier than it is now. This is going to create a serious problem of portable water for people into the mountain and we require, there will be water, but we require the additional investment to make sure that those communities are supplied that kind. And we can have now early forest fire season. Until now, we have forest fire season starting after middle of April. Now you can have it from beginning of March. These are two things that are significantly going to change into the mountain. And the departure of snow is going to create another challenge and the challenge is to hydropower generation. Some of the hydropower plant, which is, which is called a run of the river power plant, where there is no storage of water, they are, their economy is going to change. Uh, essentially because they are not getting runoff as per their plant design, but sometimes they are going to get higher, sometimes they are going to get lower. So when it let it come the summer time, there will be significant reduction into the stream runoff and their power generation capacity will increase. They might increase power, uh, will decrease and they might increase in winter time. Creating a new uh, new model, economic model for uh, uh, for the hydropower station. So let us look in Tista Basin. What really happens in Tista Basin is glaciers are retreating much higher rate uh, and because of that glaciers are vacating land. But depending upon the geomorphology of that region, the ice, the land which is vacated by ice can be converted into lake. And there are, if you look in, go into the Tista uh, river basin in Sikkim, or that matter in Arunachal Pradesh or in Bhutan, you will see that the number of lakes are increasing and existing lakes are expanding. And those lakes are really bounded by moraine. Moraine means nothing but the loose rock material carried by the glaciers and therefore it is called moraine dam lake. 
And because of the any natural calamities, such as earthquake, landslide, ice fall, or simply piping, these lakes can burst, these dams can burst and create a flash flood downstream. There are numerous such examples of such flood in the mountain. So this is this is a major problem into the eastern Himalayas. But our model now suggests that this could be much more bigger problem in western Himalaya, where the rate of retreat is just started, and by the middle of this century, we are going to have significant reduction into the glacier, uh, glaciers and number of lakes will go up dramatically into the western Himalayas. Three years back, before pandemic, I had also gone there and I have seen some photographs of glaciers. And, um, I went there and when I saw the glacier, I was, I was completely shocked to see that there is that glacier now. That is, that is, so very blue eyes has completely turned into the black eyes and they are completely gone. I was completely shocked to look at those changes of which you cannot depict on satellite images, you cannot depict uh, but we have a nice photographic record of this and I was so, so it is really, and if you look, go into the old photographic record and go there, you will realize those places doesn't exist anymore now. It is such a dynamic situation in mountain now. But I can assure you one thing, mountains are changing and they are changing very fast. And something we are not doing right. Glacier mass balance is estimated by using glaciological way. It means you go into the field, you put the stake in the ablation area, then you dip the pits in accumulation area, wherever there is snow, and you, you estimate at the end of summer how much is the snow accumulated in higher reaches and how much is the ice melted in lower reaches. Difference between these two will get you mass balance. Therefore, we have around five, six glaciers out of 9,000 glaciers monitored in Indian Himalaya by using glaciological method. But that five, six observation cannot be representative of large number of 9,000 glaciers located in different mountain ranges and located at different climatological conditions. So we require a different method which, where we can apply this. So, so this technique was developed uh, over a period of time to assess how the glaciers are losing its mass in the Himalaya. And the uh, method is very successful in, uh, uh, in picking the differential glacier mass loss into the Himalayan region. And it is now a standard method considered into the mountain region, uh, particularly in the Himalayan region. In this water treaty, three basins, Satluj, Bias, and Ravi, is allotted to India, and the Chinab, um, an upper Indus basin, uh, and Jhelum is allotted to Pakistan. Uh, so, if you look, uh, when we develop these models and try to understand how much is the glacial store water in this basin, right? So, so if you look into the original industry, the approximately 20% of water is allotted to India and 80% water is allotted to Pakistan. But if you look in terms of glacial store water, only 5% of water is stored in a 
Place is which is allotted to India and 95% of water is located in the basin in allotted to Pakistan. So obviously when treaty was written in 1960s, nobody had idea about glaciers and nobody had idea about, about the uh, contribution of glaciers in the Indian river system. Eastern basin. Uh, which is allotted to India, they, in, in a treaty term, it is called the Eastern Basin. They are losing mass at much higher rate. They are losing mass at the rate of more than meter per year. And these glaciers are retreating approximately 10 to 15 meters per year. And if you apply the hydrological model, the peak of discharge will come by the middle of century. And then the discharge will significantly start reducing. This is how glaciers we are talking. But if you look into the uh, western river, which is upper Indus, uh, Chinab and Salem river basin, there the melt is not even started. Glaciers are treating much smaller rate and their peak of runoff will come by the end of century. So there is a 50 year gap between the when when our peak will come and when their peak will come, and it is creating a very the proportionality of water which is distributed between India and Pakistan will significantly get affected from the middle of this century. So this kind of unique results can come and it can provide an interesting insight to the uh, planning community to understand what is there in future. So if India is anyway going to renegotiate a treaty, industry treaty, it's a good idea to incorporate how changes in, uh, in cryosphere will take place due to climate change, how that is going to affect the availability of water, and this could be a very interesting input for the, for the, uh, for the um, planning community. There are always uncertainties and our job is to make sure that those uncertainties are um, kept at minimum level by improving our skill of measurement. Uh, on top of that, uh, it is also very important for us to understand is whatever technique and method we apply, they are providing the information which is uh, improvement in our existing understanding in that field. In the 2007, when IPCC's issue came up and they say that Himalayan glaciers are going to vanish by 2030 or 2035, those observations which were made on a small glaciers located in the lower altitude into the glacier, when uh, some of the scientists have gone into the field and made some observations, they felt that Himalayan glaciers are going to behave like that in a totality, but reality is not, uh, not like that. So, so un uncertainty, there, there's no appreciation of one observation cannot be extended to thousands and thousands of glaciers throughout the Himalaya. So that is a, that you can say how lack of appreciation of uncertainty has created a major hiccup into the international community. Many regions are, um, uh, we have uh, difficulty because, and those difficulties obviously because of three, four reasons. One of the key reasons is many glaciated regions are disputed territories. That means different countries are saying this is our territory, another country is saying another territory. And disputed territory is not easy to go and do any research. But all those reasons, the remote sensing technique has been extensively used to monitor the glacier. Okay. But whatever may be the remote sensing, whatever may be the model outcome, we require some sort of field validation to go into the field and tell that our models are giving reasonably good results. And as Sahana was saying, we should be able to address the uncertainty. Most of the glaciers are located at very remote places. And the weather, 
is extreme. I remember, if I can tell you one small story, when, yeah. uh, when I was in year, if I remember correctly, I have, it's around year 1994 or 1995. On that year, I was camping on Chotashigri Glacier. That was first expedition. Oh, sorry, 1998, first expedition to Chota Shikri. We have gone there. And I was camping on accumulation area of the glacier. We were camping on that and almost two to three weeks we were camping there. And after two weeks or three weeks time, big blizzard started. Snow. No blizzard started and all at night, but then we have finished our, our dinner and we were sleeping in our tents and suddenly the snow blizzard has started. And it was such a huge that our, that since our camp was located on, on a very high altitude, 5,500 meters, and it was very close to the Sarauma Pass, that means the pass from which the wind was coming was blowing and it was going down in the valley. And suddenly, one of my, my tail was completely blown up into the air and I was hanging, flying into the air for some time and then it has fallen down. By great efforts, you know, I, I was inside the sleeping bag, by great efforts I could come out and then I was trying to enter into the neighbor's tent and they were not allowing me to enter. They thought some, some followers come, you know, some bear has come and somehow we survived that night and next early morning we had to decamp ourselves and come down uh, very fast into the safe place. So. What I'm trying to tell you is this PA can end up in a glacier on a life-threatening situation. And because of that, many people uh, are not prepared in India to take glaciology as their career. In addition to that, there are not academic institutions where glaciology is taught. Um, and uh, uh, because of that, their academic background is also limited in nature. In addition to that, the job is a problem also because uh, there is no institution which is dedicated for glacial studies. And what it means is uh, there are very few jobs available to the trade glacier. So all these combinations makes it very difficult for us to attract young people work in this field. So I think this, I think that right. is the major problem for us to improve our knowledge and understanding of glaciology in 